Welcome, everybody. I think we'll make a start. Um, so welcome to this Friends of the Earth Scotland and Divest Strathclyde Hustings event for the Scottish local elections. I'm Kimberly Pratt. I'm the Circular Economy Campaigner for Friends of the Earth Scotland, and I'm going to be chairing tonight. Um, we have four candidates for you tonight. So we have Richard Johnson from Scottish Conservatives, Angus Miller from the Scottish National Party, Martha Waldrop from the Scottish Greens, and Hugh Waterfield from the Scottish Liberal Democrats. Um, Scottish Labour were also invited, but they were unable to attend. Um, I am just going to run through a couple of little admin things before we get going. Um, so Tonight, this event is entirely online. Um, as Maliki mentioned, we'll be recording the whole event. Um, can I ask that everybody please turns off their microphones when they're not speaking? Um, and you're welcome to have your videos on or off. Um, Friends of the Air Scotland have uh, produced a manifesto for the Scottish local elections. So you can have a look at that on our website um, and Sally, my colleague, will share the link in the chat for that. Um, it, so we'll start with each candidate having the opportunity to make an opening statement. Um, each candidate will get two minutes to speak and I'll ask everybody to please keep to time tonight uh, so we're able to move on to questions as soon as possible. Um, I will let you know when you've got about 30 seconds remaining. Um, we, after everybody has made their opening statements, we'll start with a couple of set questions. Um, each candidate will have two minutes to answer each question. Um, and after our set questions, we will open questions to the floor. And I would invite anybody who has a question to put it in the chat and um, Sally will um, collect those. Um, she will pass me a couple of questions. I'm afraid I, we won't have time to answer all the questions uh, tonight, um, but we'll try and cover a broad range of issues. Um, if we have time, we'll pause for a break at around 8 p.m. And at um, 8.45, we will end questions and I'll ask the candidates to finish with a closing statement each. And we'll aim to finish at about nine o'clock tonight. Um, so without further ado, I will ask the candidates to uh, start with their opening statements. Um, so can we go to Richard Johnson from the Scottish Conservatives first, please? That's fine, yeah. So hello everyone, uh, I'm Richard Johnson. I'm here on behalf of the Glasgow Conservatives and I'm standing in the Springburn Rob Royston ward. Thank you for having me and welcome to the other candidates. So Glasgow is in the midst of a deep environmental and cleansing crisis. We have now been moved to a three weekly bin collection cycle and the SNP's bulk uplift charge has resulted in a terrible record on flight epic with over, with over 25,000 incidents reported in 2021, whereas in Edinburgh, which came second place, they just had 13,000 incidents. These changes happened because the SNP administration, rather than fighting back against cuts coming down from Holyrood, chose to implement major cuts to waste services. Now for the current budget cycle, the 2022-23 cycle, Glasgow City Council as a whole across all departments faces a 19.7 million pound budget shortfall. But we all know that green improvements can only come through investment and that the leaders of both Glasgow and Edinburgh have told the net zero committee that they cannot meet net zero targets without more support, yet the cuts still come. The Glasgow Conservatives are standing to fight for a fair funding deal for our city and to do all that it takes to clean up Glasgow. Our five point plan includes, includes restoring the fortnightly bin collection, scrapping the bulk uplift charge in its entirety and investing 10 million pounds in frontline cleansing services throughout the council term. We're all here today to talk about the environment. The Glasgow Conservatives have a range of policies from pre, pre subway travel to the under 22s and over 60s to no, prioritise Richard to prioritising brownfield sites in development and training the next generation of parks and cleansing workers that aim to improve the environment and our green spaces. We want to extend the car club scheme, introduce rapid charging hubs across the city and implement dual purpose street lights that can also function as charging points. At the same time, we don't want to hammer 
ordinary glass regions, say motorists with um, say the low emission zone or work on, on a congestion charge, etc. We believe- That's that, two minutes, so can you wrap up please? Thank you. I look forward to talking about this and uh, much more this evening. Thank you. Thanks very much, Richard. Okay, can we go to Angus Miller from the Scottish National Party next, please? Thank you very much. Uh, as you see, I'm Angus Miller. I'm a councillor and candidate for Anderson City, York Hill Ward, and it's a pleasure to be here this evening. Confronting the climate emergency is without a doubt one of the most pressing tasks that the council uh, will have uh, over the next five year term. Uh, under the city's first ever SNP administration, Glasgow has put in place its most progressive and ambitious ever plans to promote climate action with the city's first ever climate plan and a target of becoming a net zero carbon city by 2030. Uh, and we're proud of the city level leadership that Glasgow has shown uh, and the SNP's record of working constructively with other parties to advance the climate agenda. But we know there's so much more still to be done. Glasgow's CO2 emissions have already fallen by 41% between 2006 and 2019. Uh, but we know that this is largely low-hanging fruit uh, as Scotland's electricity supply has been de decarbonised uh, and so getting to 2030 will require a huge effort spanning all levels of government involving our communities and the third and private sectors. The decarbonisation of home energy and transport are two of our biggest challenges. Uh, the SNP will work to plan for and secure investment in a massive investment programme for home, home energy retrofit, working with partners in the Glasgow City region to plan out how this huge undertaking can be progressed uh, and making the case for national investment. Uh, we will support the transition of public transport to lower carbon options, including via the proposed Clyde Metro system of light rail to connect our communities. We will continue our work to support the transition to electric vehicles, including via our council fleet strategy and the rollout of public EV charging. And we'll continue our work to rebalance streets away from private cars and towards people and to reduce the number of kilometres travelled by private vehicles by 30%. And we will work across sectors to design and implement our Glasgow Green Deal, developing policy, policy responses and advocating for resources to transition our economy for a net zero future, embedding climate in our economic policy and making the structural changes necessary. Glasgow is making progress on climate action, but we're clear that we must intensify our work and raise our ambition at every available opportunity. And the SNP is committed to working across our cities. We make that journey to a lower carbon Glasgow. Thank you. Brilliant. That was two minutes exactly. Well done. <laughs> Okay, so we'll go on to Martha Wardrop from the Scottish Greens, please. Thank you for the invitation to the hustings this evening. My name is Martha Wardrop from the Scottish Greens and a, a candidate for the Hillhead Ward. Uh, the latest intergovernmental panel on climate change uh, set out a report showing that we needed to avert climate disaster in the next five years. Um, we have to avoid the worst outcomes for climate change, and I'm glad that you've organised this hustings to put this on the agenda. Uh, we have to, we must end our reliance on fossil fuel reliance, and the cities like Glasgow can lead the way on a meaningful climate action, financing cities to reduce our carbon emissions and build resilience to future climate shocks is absolutely vital. And I'm really glad to see you all here this evening to talk about these issues. We are on a pathway to global temperature rise of more than double 1.5 degrees. And currently there's far too much money still flowing into fossil fuels and not enough into clean energy climate solutions. So in this term of the council, we will have to see big shifts in finance to reinvest and put money in the right places to restrict global warming to a level that is survivable. So in the council elections, I'm asking you to vote for a Scottish Green candidate um, who can bring this urgent change to Glasgow. A vote for the Scottish Greens is a vote that knows the climate is the biggest and most urgent challenge we face. 30 seconds. Actions we take to restore nature and cut emissions can also end deep-seated inequalities and injustices. And we must put investment where it matters. So I'm happy to answer any questions and look forward to the evening ahead. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Martha. And then we'll come to Hugh Waterfield from the Scottish Liberal Democrats. Hugh, Hugh you're on mute still. Hugh? Hi, can you um, unmute, please? Okay. 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 As I, as I tried to say, 
um, being amongst friends is going to be very different for me tomorrow evening when I will not be amongst friends, I guess. Um, we are all, or should be, on the same side. And if we have enemies as such, they are climate change deniers. We only have the one planet. That's one of the reasons why I'm a green liberal Democrat. There have been all sorts of false promises from capitalists who never made an accurate or honest inventory of the planet that we inhabit. They have sold off the family silver and our universal birthright. We must concentrate on renewables. Could I mention a, a vexed problem? I don't think that opening up the Cambo oil field would be a move in the right direction. Now, we can't do it all, but we must advocate for common sense and restraint. There are a number of problems facing us. Many of us are candidates. There is greed. That's represented by people who think it's a great idea to be a frequent flyer, to buy mega yachts or drive gas guzzlers. Not a great idea. There are, of course, also far too many human beings. 30 seconds. And that is a really nasty nettle that we have to grab. There is ignorance. Often it is willful ignorance. But then people who are thinking that they are smart enough to understand it have frankly failed to explain it to people, which is why, for example, when delivering leaflets today, I was constantly picking up cans to put into the blue wheelie bins. Okay, that, that that's fine. Can you wrap up, please? You. The way in which we must address from very small steps in the right thing. There are far too many dishonest politicians about who don't wish to be the bearers of bad news. We must do okay. better. Okay. Thank you very much, you, and thank you to everyone for their opening statements. Um, I would now uh, like to ask uh, Lewis from Divest Strathclyde to ask our first set question. Um, Lewis? Hi, uh, yes, I'm Lewis and I'm from the local group Divest Strathclyde, so thanks to Friends of the Earth Scotland for inviting us to go host this event tonight. So my question is something like this. In 2021, Glasgow City Council voted overwhelmingly to, to support the fossil fuel divestment of the Strathclyde Pension Fund, which we were very pleased about. However, the update to the climate change strategy, which was passed by the committee last month, was deemed by Friends of the Earth Scotland na analysis to be very unlikely to achieve divestment. So bearing these issues in mind, if elected, what would you and your party do to support fossil fuel divestment in Glasgow as advocated by the city's climate emergency implementation plan? Great, thank you very much, Lewis. We'll go to Angus Miller from the SNP first, please. Thank you very much, uh, Kimberly. So, I mean, first of all, I think it's important to uh, to reiterate what Lewis has just said there, that the Council has already taken a position uh, that uh, the Council, uh, Glasgow City Council, believes that divestment is, is the right path forward for Strathclyde Pension Fund. We do have a delineation between SPF as a, as a body and, and its committee and the, the trustees of that, uh, of which I'm not uh, one, uh, with, with certain fiduciary duties and uh, processes that need to be undertaken in order to um in, in order to, to steward the 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 uh, their kind of responsibilities um as spf trustees um but the council obviously has um a, a position of, of influence um and we have used our voice um very strongly to say that we believe that spf um divestment is is the way to go um and i know that the the members uh, of um uh, the, the 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 committee um are pursuing that um, through um, through their roles as, as, as trustees, and indeed that's the process that's un being undertaken. My understanding of the, the kind of current state of play is that there is um, various analysis and kind of route mapping work going on to um, for the SPF to satisfy itself as to how it will be able to um, 
uh, take forward um, a divestment strategy. Um, I uh, very much hope that it can do so as quickly as possible. I think the timescales need to be um, as ambitious as possibly can, um, but ultimately they also need to be uh, taking that forward in a way um, that is, uh, as I've said, um, consistent with their fiduciary responsibilities as trustees um, of the um, Pension Fund Committee. So in terms of what we can do more broadly as a council, um, we will, uh, I, th I think, you know, continue to reiterate um, our position on SPF divestment, continue to, to use our voice and also hopefully facilitate um, discussions with other cities and other pension funds around the world who have undergone or embarked upon similar journeys um, to ensure that any lessons that can be learned uh, for Glasgow and for, for SPF can be can be learned as quickly as possible um, so that the process is one that can take place um, uh, in a kind of reasonable and quick timescale because we know that it's it's important that um, this is an agenda that is advanced as quickly as is practical as possible. Great, thank you very much. Okay, we will go to Martha Wardrop next, please, from the Scottish Greens. Yeah, I think this last term of the Council, we have, Greens have been leading the charge on this through the budget process, uh, through motions to full Council. And I, I have been on the Glasgow Pension Fund for that time as well. Um, I note that you, you've got, you're seeking candidates to make a commitment to divest. And obviously there will be new councillors joining the councils, but I see that Scottish Greens will continue to be pushing on this agenda into the next term of the council. Uh, a lot of it, I, I think, has to be looked at in terms of the IPCC reporting. And everything is very much set by global reporting, not local reporting on this. It's obviously the pension funds investing uh, on a range of, of um, projects, not just within Glasgow and the west of Scotland. But obviously there needs to be continued pressure to look at the investments um, and there'll be further reports come to that committee, I'm sure, and the trustees of the, the committee will have to follow procedures. Um, I'm sure that Friends of the Earth and Divest Strathclyde will continue to keep up the pressure and uh, I hope that you, you'll, uh, you'll continue to supply information and, and resources that are of interest to councillors over the, the next term of the council. 30 seconds. Um, there's obviously much more work to be done um, uh, by, your, by the councillors uh, continuing to work on this agenda. It's a, a major issue for us deal with. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Sorry. Uh, thank you very much, Martha. We'll go to Hugh Waterfield next, please. Yeah, I am astonished at the lack of information that goes out to the British public from most current city councillors. It's really dreadful. It's the most common complaint. If there is a decision to disinvest in fossil fuels, as Lewis is, I think, suggesting, well, it should have been done before now. Very recently, football clubs, perhaps under pressure, maybe not, have cut their ties with Russian oligarchs. It took them hours, not years, to put things right. And if we are serious, we are within a very small, measurable period of time before it will all be too late to do something about it. There are plenty of companies which are operating in fields which do not destroy the planet. The city of Glasgow must disinvest from the climate destroyers very, very quickly. You still have a few seconds left if you have anything yeah. else to say. <laughs> Don't need to say more. That's it. Brilliant. OK, thanks very much. Um, thank you, Hugh. And then we'll come to Richard Johnson next, please. Thank you. So this is not a topic I know particularly very much about, 
I can only really tell you my general position on kind of divestment from oil and gas or fossil fuels, which is that in general, it's a good thing. Um, so I guess my general I don't know, sentiment would be to support it, um, but the particular speed at which it is done or I don't know which particular companies we're talking about divesting from, that's not kind of something that I have, have thought about. And that's all I can, that's all I can really say. Okay. Um, if, if that's uh, what we have to say, we'll, we'll move on to the next question. And um, thanks very much to Lewis from Divest, Jeff Clyde for that question. Um, our next question um, is about recycling. So Glasgow has the third lowest recycling rates of any local authority in Scotland. So if elected, what will you do to improve this? We'll go first to Martha Wardrop, please. Uh, well, Scottish Greens have been leading uh, efforts to improve the recycling rates in the last term of the council. We're aware that people are dissatisfied with the recycling service but we have been hampered by the pandemic and it's not been ideal, um, obviously with, with staffing issues uh, being the main concern, but also uh, issues with the fleet and vehicle breakdowns and general um, difficulties managing the situation. A lot more people obviously getting deliveries to the home as well. There's a lot more cardboard and there's opportunities to increase the tonnage is quite rapidly um, there's, a, there's more can be done. So we have through the budget process put additional money into recycling services and we're targeting tenements. A big focus is going to be tenements in the next term because tenements have been the one, the housing stock that's most disadvantaged at the moment and is having major issues with recycling. We need to increase the food waste recycling uh, provisions, uh, the blue bin provisions. Obviously there's changes coming down the line um, so we've pushed for a plastic reduction strategy as well. We've got to, uh, and the refill um, agenda is also something we've pushed. So we need to keep exploring um, the, you know, efforts to, to improve um, the reuse, recycling and repair. Cafes have been set up, but more project investment is needed through the circular economy. 30 uh, seconds. So we've, we are leading on that. Um, and we will continue to push for more funding for recycling, specifically around tenements. Okay, thank you very much, Martha. Um, we will go to Hugh Waterfield next, please. Yeah, um, this is a, 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 a knotty problem without any doubt. And we have to look for balance of advantage Glasgow City Council must both urge and persuade residents to cooperate with the separation of the elements of all household waste. It's very clear that some people who should know better, I'm not naming names of course, manage to put everything into any bin that they come to first. And that's just appalling. First of all, we need to recycle and we must encourage people by explaining to them why they should recycle. Why, for example, bauxite can't be melted until it reaches 1,600 degrees centigrade, but aluminium cans can be melted at 800, and that's half the energy use. This sort of information is not provided for Mr. and Mrs. Citizen, and it really must do. It's no good bullying people or cursing and swearing. You must explain, all councillors must explain, and that means all the, um, all the permanent officials must explain. We cannot just go around bullying our fellow residents. We've got to get them on our side cooperating. I think it's a very good thing that the green wheelie bins are now emptied every third week, because it has made people realize that you cannot continue assuming that will be landfill. There won't be. I mean, that has got to be explained to people. And it's not because the council is unkind or 
ruthless or in any way kind of horrible, but it is a fact and you can't walk away from it. Brilliant, thank you very much. Um, and we'll go to Richard Johnson next, please. So I kind of have a two part answer to that. My first is that I know that the Scottish Conservatives are introducing or are wanting to introduce a circular economy bill, which is basically going to set targets on kind of um, single use items or, or kind of items that are difficult to recycle. And I also know that as part of that bill, they're going to set up something called a Centre for Circular Economy Excellence. And the entire purpose of that is going to be researching basically more ways to, to kind of create a circular economy. Um, my second part of that it was kind of is to partly pick up on, on something that was just said. Now, Glasgow is on a th three weekly bin collection cycle, and that's not a good thing because all that is happening is that there is a, a, a kind of mass waste crisis as, because of that. There is, as I said, there's mass fly tipping, there's mass rubbish in the streets. So the Glasgow Conservatives want to restore the, the fortnightly bin collection. And, you know, the reason why public bins are overflowing is because people are not able to kind of get rid of their waste. So essentially, they're stuffing it into public bins or it's being dumped. So there has to be a kind of responsible way of, of collecting this waste. And part of that just simply involves getting back to a fortnightly bin collection and, and simple investment in, in kind of waste cleansing services. Um, 30 seconds. Thank you. And the Glasgow Conservatives intend to basically invest £10 million in frontline cleansing services uh, over the course of this council, restore the fortnightly bin collection. Um, well, as I said, we'll eliminate the bulk uplift charge. All of these are to clean up the streets, basically. Um, Thank you very much. Great, thank you. Um, so we'll go to Angus Muller from SNP, please. Thanks, uh, Chair. Uh, I mean, I think first of all, it's important to acknowledge that Glasgow has had historically low recycling rates, and that is something that we, we absolutely need to do better on. The, the figures have started uh, to improve uh, in Glasgow, but obviously, as, as Martha had indicated there, that the pandemic has in, impacted our ability to, you know, you know to, to, to progress. I, I want to touch firstly on, 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 on what the Conservative candidate just there was talking about, because actually I think what, what he was saying earlier is, uh, is uh, you know, touching on, on an element of truth. There is a reason why there have been various reforms to, uh, uh, to uh, domestic waste uh, provision within the city, and that is to align our services with the Scottish Charter on Household Recycling, which uh, is, is all about trying to have services that promote behaviour change and, and, and promote uptake of recycling. And that's something that many local authorities around the country are signed up to. And indeed, the Conservative run Aberdeenshire Council um, is just uh, at this very moment moving to a three weekly bin collection using Scottish Government money to enable and facilitate that precisely on the same basis as Glasgow made that reform uh, to align ourselves with the Scottish Charter on Household Recycling. So I think it's important just to, to, to bust that particular myth there. There's a few things that I would just very briefly uh, touch on. Um, I think Martha's right to, to reference tenements as being um, a particular challenge and we need, to, we need to do better. One of the things we need to do is ensure that there's a parity of, of waste streams between tenements and front and back door properties so that, for example, you know, we, we need to work towards, for example, glass um, being able to, to be more efficiently collected, um, you know, uh, whether that's by reviewing on street provision, uh, as we currently have, or, or by moving to door-to-door. To -door. We need to fundamentally review uh, services for tenements, um, I, I think, to, to ensure that we have better provision there. Um, we, need to, we, we need to expand the number of things that can be recycled in the city. There are too many materials that cannot. Um, and we need investment in our waste processing facilities in order to make that happen. And for example, the Scottish Government's Recycling Improvement Fund, uh, which we're actively preparing bids towards, will allow us to, uh, to expand the amount of material that can, be, um, that can be recycled. And finally, dealing with issues around what's called contamination, which is exactly, I think, what Hugh mentioned earlier, where you have the wrong materials being put in the wrong bins, is absolutely vital because uh, that stops us from being able to, um, to get the recycler up. And it's also actually one of the biggest underlying causes of of, uh, disruptions to bin services that we've seen in recent years so we need to get to grips with all of these issues um, and we will be actively trying to secure Scottish Government funding which has been made available through the Recycling Improvement Fund to be able to do that. Okay. 
thank you very much. Um, okay, so uh, I'd like to remind everybody that you're welcome to ask uh, questions. Please just pop your questions in the chat and we'll get through as many as we can. Um, we're going to open up the floor to questions now. Um, the first question on my list is from Doreen Osborne, which is about the heat and energy strategy. Um, Doreen, would you like to ask your question? Um, I'll see if Maliki, are you able to unmute Doreen, please? Yes, yeah, sorry, I just need to find Doreen in the big list of people. Um, Kim, can you possibly read it out if you have it there? Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll read that out for you, Doreen. Okay, so um, local heat and energy strategies are due to be published by all local authorities by the end of 2023. What would be your key points for your local authorities' heat and energy strategy? Um, right, we'll go first to Hugh Waterfield, please. The first initiative that I would like to see clear evidence of is that there is a presumption that any new building must have, or at any rate, have contemplated photovoltaic cells on the roof. And if it's a greenfield or even a brownfield site, a soil heat pump should be also a requirement for planning consent. If we can't, I think the expense of retrofitting once buildings are up is really daunting. Uh, I would ask Martha's view on that because she knows a lot about it. But the, the appearance of flat roof buildings, innocent of any concession to climate change and the problems which we face is really very upsetting. You still have one minute if you would like to say anything else uh, on heat and energy strategies. I, I will take that as no. Um, let's move on to Richard Johnson, please. Thank you very much, thank you. Um, so it's an important issue because basically around half of Scottish homes don't meet energy efficiency standards. That's that's Scotland wide. Um, and obviously it's a key part. If, if you're going for net zero, you need obviously increased energy efficiency. Um, so my understanding of, of the kind of Scottish Conservatives two big pushes on this would be number one, that we would in we would seek to invest across Scotland, 2.5 billion pounds over the next five years on energy efficiency in, in existing homes and buildings. I mean, it's all well and good saying, yes, we've got to focus on better standards in new ones. But as I said, the reality is that half of Scottish homes don't, don't meet the standard. So there has to be investment. And the second part of that is that we would establish a help to renovate scheme. And, and essentially this would seek to support owners in making their properties kind of more energy efficient. Um, now, my understanding of, of the kind of scheme is, as, as well is that there would be a rural element of it, that specifically for rural homes that would be somewhat separate, but that's a kind of, um, that's a different kind of worms as it were, and it's, it has its own challenges. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, that's, all, that's all I can say. Okay, thank you very much, Richard. We'll move on to Angus Miller, please. Thanks very much, Kimberly. Um, yeah, so work uh, is uh, actively progressing on the Council's uh, LHEs, and uh, I, I believe we'll have a further update uh, later this year. We, we had a, a report to committee um, just uh, a couple of months ago, um, uh, or last month, beginning last month, I think, uh, on uh, the progress in developing that. Um, I, I won't um, kind of go through all of the details, but I think a few things just to, to pull out that I think are really important. One, we need to be pursuing uh, opportunities and building uh, concrete cases for uh, district heating initiatives. We've kind of dabbled as a city with district heating and there's a, a number of different proposals that um, are uh, on the table at various stages of development, but I think we need to put in place uh, 
plans to, to 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 be able to actually roll that out on a on a much more comprehensive basis for the city. Um, and one of the things we need to do is is build the case for investment in that, um, both uh, from from government um, and and from uh, and, and from local government as well as uh, from uh, private sector as well. Um, home energy retrofit, I touched on in my opening remarks, is is going to be absolutely crucial to uh, reaching net zero into the uh, to the decarbonisation agenda. Um, we know that there is a need for for further investment in that and uh, for, for for further capital to be made available from national government. Um, and we will be making the case to both uh, the Scottish and UK governments uh, for the the financial uh, kind of powers that, that that we need and the resources to be able to um, to roll that out um, really. A, 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 as quick a pace as, as possible, because uh, one thing that we know um, across the Glasgow City region um, is that there is a, a significant proportion um, of uh, homes that don't meet the um, the energy efficiency standards that we would like them to do. So, so we need to we need to make that forward at base uh, at a particular pace. Um, and uh, the other thing is uh, we want to try and promote more opportunities for local renewable energy generation. Um, particularly with, uh, with community, um, you know, kind of community generation opportunities. So one of the things that I'm very keen to do is to, to see us review what the policies are that we have as a council in place uh, to be able to facilitate that and allow that to happen. Um, and I think uh, as, as part of developing a community energy strategy, um, uh, that would be a, a really important priority. And that's something that we want to take forward in the next term. That's great. Thank you very much. OK, uh, Martha Wardrip next, please. Yeah, thanks for this question. Uh, um, obviously, energy bills are on, in everyone's mind at the moment, and so this, doc, this strategy is going to be crucial um, for families across the city. We uh, see it as part of the Just Transition framework that we're pushing for a Just Transition board uh, and much more focus on a Just Transition in the next term of the Council. So that obviously people have experienced fuel poverty Get the support they need to get their, their homes retrofitted uh, but we'll obviously have to work uh, as part of the planning city planning framework that's coming forward as well as a new city plan and the, the local heat and energy strategy will be part of supplementary guidance a, a statutory a document to influence development across the city so that all new developments uh, will be supporting the net zero ambitions as uh, it's obviously got to be a rapid transition in the next five years, moving away from oil and gas. So it's very much about renewable energy uh, retrofit and making sure that we've got all houses connected to district heating or as many as, as possible to cut costs in the long run for families. Um, we have been obviously looking at job opportunities as part of this. And uh, there has to be is obviously supporting the Green New Deal and creating new jobs and apprenticeships as part of it is obviously critical as well because there's, all, there's all many people that could be retrained and supported into employment with this programme as well. Uh, so I say we, we, there has been consultation with the public on it. Um, and, but a lot of it will be down to financing from Scottish government and UK government and the private sector. So there will be, have to be a, a big focus on uh, engaging with the wider community as well and involving people in development of projects through housing associations and tenants. We've got a tenant led commission that will be obviously involved in it as well. OK, thank you. Thank you very much, Martha. Um, let's move on to Hugh Waterfield, please. Well, we're back again, I think, to uh, the way in which we address the problem which is coming down the road, if you like the elephant in the corner of the room. The tipping point for getting things right could be within the lifetime of the next quinquennial council. I'm not saying it will be, but it could be. And if we are to be fair, not only to the people of the world, but the people of Scotland, then we must, we must do something about it and as soon as possible. If we look at, I mean, we've already touched on, on housing. 
one of the things which has been suggested um, has been much better insulation, but we don't want cladding of the Grenfell Tower variety, clearly. So we've got to steer a sensible engineering knowledge-based solution to the problems that confront us. And I think knee-jerk reactions are probably not helpful. There isn't a single councillor in Glasgow, I suspect, who isn't well aware of the seriousness of the situation. But are they doing much about it? Well, that will be decided in the opinion of the voters on the 5th of May. Great. That's it. Okay. Thanks very much, Hugh. And we'll go to Richard Johnson, please. Sure. Um, could you just repeat the question? I kind of got one half of it, but not the other half. Yeah, of course. So um, the question was from Dor Doreen Osborne, um, and it was local heat and energy strategies are due to be published by all local authorities by the end of 2023. Hmm. What would be your key points for your local authorities heat and energy strategy? Sure. Um, I, I kind of thought I answered this, but essentially the um, It, it would be 2.5 billion. The Conservatives are, are looking to spend 2.5 billion um, in kind of retrofitting and, and improving the energy efficiency of homes. And um, they are also essentially looking to um, implement a kind of uh, a fund to help homes transition. Uh, and we also want to keep the 100 pound affordable warmth, warmth payment basically. Um, yeah, thank you. Brilliant. Okay, thank you. Um, so we'll go to our next question. Um, rather than asking people to read out their questions, um, I'm going to read them out. Uh, just um, save time unmuting people and finding them uh, in the room and things. Um, so um, the next question we have is on social housing from Carmen. Um, it's, it's quite a long question, uh, but it's a really relevant one. So um, I'll, I'll just uh, take a minute to read this out. Uh, so Wheatley Homes, formerly Glasgow Housing Association, in partnership with Glasgow City Council, continues to invest significant sums to de uh, demolish social housing and pass this practice off as to the public as sustainable and popular. Tens of thousands of socially rented flats have been reduced to rubble in the last decade to be replaced by low density new builds, most of them at mid market or affordable rent or less as empty sites waiting for investment. Will you as councillors recognise that the current demolition and replace approach to social housing accelerates the housing, climate and cost of living crisis, promotes fossil fuel dependency, disrupts and scatters communities and keeps people locked into fuel poverty? Will you condemn the practice of Wheatley Homes and promise to protect and invest in social housing as part of your climate commitment? Um, and we'll go first to Angus Miller, please. Thanks very much. Um, so there's, there's a few points there that I'd, I'd want to pick up on. So firstly, I mean, in terms of uh, building new social and affordable housing, it absolutely needs to be uh, a commitment um, for uh, for the city. We, we, we need to support um, and, and invest in the, the stock that is already there. And I would expect uh, registered social landlords and housing associations to, to, to be doing that. Uh, but we also uh, clearly need to, to, to build more as well. Um, over the past, uh, five years, I think it's five and a half thousand social and affordable homes have been built in the city um, with, a, with a further six and a half thousand uh, kind of planned over the next five years um, of the council term. Um, I, I'm not overly familiar with the, the, the particular proposals at the Wineford, so I wouldn't want to comment on the, the merits or demerits there, but I think clearly there have been examples in the city of um, 
really uh, good quality refurbishment and retrofit that I think is, is a really kind of good gold standard. So for example, I think it's the Cedar Court flats, um, which I think are Queen's Cross uh, Housing Association uh, in Woodside. They've been kind of internationally recognised as being a really good example of where um, social housing has been uh, invested in and refurbished uh, to a much higher energy efficiency standard. I think that's uh, absolutely something that we should be promoting. Um, and within the SMP's manifesto for these elections, uh, we've also committed when the the review of the city development plan, which is kind of council planning policy, kind of a master document, uh, and that's due for review over the next couple of years. It's kind of reviewed every seven to, to, to nine years or so. Um, one of the things that we've committed to doing is to okay. is to embedding response to the climate emergency within that, uh, and that would include um, uh, the aspiration to have there a, a presumption in favour of uh, the retention of buildings with, re with, with refurbishment and retrofit as opposed to, as opposed to demolition, um, and that goes for, for all kinds of uh, buildings. So uh, obviously we've got a process to go through in terms of uh, drafting and consulting on that planning policy and what that looks like and how those different uh, the themes and, and aspects uh, interrelate with each other. But it's definitely something that I think we recognise that we need to, um, we need to be retrofitting and refurbishing buildings uh, as a kind of response to the climate emergency. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Martha Wardrop. I would encourage you to have a look at the Glasgow Green Party Manifesto. And we set out uh, our actions that we propose to address the concerns about demolition and loss of our heritage. We obviously have to increase funding to address the repairs and energy efficiency improvements to the, to the pre 1919 tenement stop, working with housing associations um, to acquire properties that have gone into disrepair or are dilapidated and bringing them back into use through effective factoring and working with um, owners as well within some of the tenements. Uh, I've seen successful projects take go forward it does quite require quite a lot of effort to co coordinate the improvements of tenements. And there's an issue with VAT at the moment on older buildings, making it more expensive to upgrade existing buildings than build new. So I've certainly been pushing for changes to VAT. I'd hope that you'd work with heritage groups across the city to raise this agenda a bit more in the coming term of the council. We need to work with the Heritage Trusts and the Building Preservation Trusts um, on this and strengths and protections for our heritage. Uh, I think the City Development Plan is an opportunity to protect buildings and, and prevent demolition. It is working with councillors, uh, looking at training for councillors as well on the importance of heritage. I have seen, uh, like what's been highlighted, some high rises like Cedar Court but that requires councillors picking up and supporting buildings and, and objecting to their demolition along with community groups and activists such as yourself. And there has to be concerted pressure put on developers to protect buildings from tem demolition. It's too easy for them and to make it more difficult. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martha. Uh, let's move on to Hugh Waterfield, please. This is um, yet another topic where joined up government is essential. Social housing is very akin to social welfare. The ALIOs, the arm's length um, external organizations have been fairly unsuccessful, but I can think of one housing development, not very close to me, but it's a Queen's Cross, and I think they have been really remarkably successful. So it can be done. Affordable rent is absolutely essential. I think all councillors should be prepared to be quite bullish with building companies who will say a figure which will give them a 30% profit margin. They don't need a 30% profit margin if society goes to hell in a handcart. 5% will be quite sufficient and will keep them in good funds and indeed public esteem. Affordable rent 
benefits the social work department. It benefits the NHS because people can be released from hospital beds to somewhere safe and well organized. The scourge of homelessness can be tackled, but not without quite a lot of effort. And I can think of one particular housing, but I'll tell you very briefly, but I won't okay, mention can... the housing company for obvious legal reasons. There was an agreement that in a particular development, 30% of the houses should be for social rent. Well, when they went up, the social rent element was precisely zero. Now, that must not be allowed to happen. It really must not. Councillors should be brave enough to consider all the people of Glasgow in That's our time. case uh, and take these people on board and say, do you want the business or don't you? But okay. the people will not pay endless sums of money so that you can go off to the Bahamas every six weeks. OK, thank you very much. Um... That's great. Um, we'll go to Richard Johnson next, please. Sure, thank you. So I know that three of our kind of big pledges around this area. Well, firstly, I just want to say that, um, you know, I take the points about kind of demolition and heritage. Um, you know, I'm a conservative, I very much believe in heritage. Um, I wouldn't want things to be demolished unnecessary, unnecessarily. Um, but we have these kind of three, uh, three big elements around kind of social housing. First is that um, we kind of want to support the use of something called mid-market rent. Um, so it's, it's generally seen as a kind of more affordable um, form of rent level because it's lower rent than the area's market rent level. Um, the, also what we want to do is bring more empty homes into, into use. Uh, and we want to ease planning rules so to allow kind of former shops and offices to be transformed into, into housing. Um, now on homelessness, I know that we want to create a city convener for homelessness. So this will be a position and their, their entire purpose will be to work with charities basically to end rough sleeping. And that will also in include working with house housing associations, social right. housing bodies, this kind of thing. Um, but yes, um, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks very much, Richard. Um, okay, so uh, we'll move on to our next question, which is on transport. It's from Andrea Pearson, um, uh, and I'll read out her question. So, uh, transport is one area that lets Scotland down. We are still very reliant on private cars. When buses and trains are so much better now, Wi-Fi, recharging points, e-tickets, etc. Um, sorry, when buses and trains are so much better now, do the candidates agree it is now time for a radical move towards free public transport for all to encourage this transition? Um, can we go to Martha Wardrop first for that question? Yeah, Scottish Green Councillors, I have uh, managed to get the council to agree to a, a public free, not a free public transport pilot project, which is going to be developed in the next if, year, and we um, are committed to promoting free public transport. Something that we've uh, highlighted in our manifesto, it's following on from a free public transport for under 21s that's been rolled out with the support from, from Greens. Um, we have obviously more to do in terms of getting uh, improvements to public transport generally. And it's outlined in our manifesto, our key commitments. We have to encourage people to be able to use the bus services and, and support development of publicly owned bus service in the longer run. And that's something we've commit, we're committed to as well. Obviously, we, we're um, working with activists uh, to look at all the options going forward. But I'd encourage everyone to get involved in the free public transport pilot project that's coming up as part of the council's work in the next year. Thank you, 
very much, Martha. Um, we'll move on to Hugh Waterfield, please. This is uh, another situation which I don't envy uh, current councillors trying to wrestle with this particular problem. It's been suggested, for example, that we should take buses and trains back fully in the house, uh, as the expression goes. That would enable councils in cooperation with other neighbouring councils where appropriate to provide something that was integrated and reliable. The other day I waited for the once every 15 minutes bus and I stood there in the cold for an hour before anything turned up at all. This does not encourage people to leave the car at home, uh, even my hybrid car, I may say. It is something that the council must grapple with. There's a shortage of drivers because more and more people are turning to delivery vans. And I know how, because I speak to drivers. I don't ask the officials in George Square. No, I ask the people who actually suffer the situation. There are other problems I won't mention, but the Caledonia Depot, for example, which a year ago had precisely two electric buses, now has more than 80. So there is good news, and I'm not trying to be negative here at all, but I really think that we, as a group of citizens, should be more ambitious about what we do. Cross-ticketing is going to be a, a, a thing that we must consider seriously. Thank you. Thanks very much. Richard Johnson. Yeah, thank you very much. So this is a somewhat challenging question because we all want really good public transport. And the Scottish Conservatives um, for Glasgow want to make free subway uh, want to make subway transport free for the under 22s and the over 60s and that should help to kind of encourage people more into public transport however public transport a, a really world-class kind of really good public transport system can only happen with investment now the as i kind of said previously glasgow city council for this year had a 19.7 million pound funding shortfall which was ultimately handed to it from the SNP gov Green government in Holyrood. So it, you've kind of got to, they've got to talk the talk, but they don't, they, don't walk to, they don't walk the walk, as it were. So without that funding to create a world-class public transport system, people depend on their cars. And yet, basically, Susan Aitken's administration in, in Glasgow has pushed ahead with the low emissions zone there's even talk of toll roads. There's talk of introducing the workplace parking levy, known as the car park tax. Uh, there's talk of a congestion charge. All these measures in the middle of a cost of living crisis when people depend on their cars because the public transport system is, is, is not up to scratch as a viable alternative for so many people, particularly from pe uh, for people who come from further afield. So to me, it's you can't punish people if there is no viable alternative to their car. So that's why the Glasgow Conservatives would essentially uh, delay the low emissions zone. We would have no toll roads. We would scrap the car park tax or we wouldn't go ahead with it. And we'd end any work on the congestion charge. Thank you very much. Great, thank you very much. Angus Muller, please. Thanks, uh, Kimberly. I mean, first of all, I, I agree with the premise that, you know, we we have to improve public transport, um, you know, as part of the transition to, you know, in terms of behaviour change. But I mean, it's not particularly surprising to hear the Conservatives, uh, you know, kind of uh, list all of the things they're against, because the Conservatives in Glasgow and elsewhere have opposed at every single stage any single policy that's been put forward by the council or by the Scottish government to reduce our reliance on private cars. Uh, and yes, absolutely, we need to be um, supporting 
um, more accessible and more, affo more affordable public transport. Um, but we also uh, need to be uh, working to, to try and um, reduce private car uh, journeys and uh, indeed our, our transport strategy has, has a target of 30% reduction in vehicle kilometres uh, travelled uh, within the city because we want to promote active travel and public transport um, instead of unnecessary private car journeys. Um, in terms of uh, the question of free public transport, um, I'm, I'm broadly sympathetic uh, to, to, to that agenda and uh, indeed as Martha notes we have the, the, the commitment there to or the funding there for uh, for the um, uh, free public transport pilot and we'll be working to, to see how we can uh, roll that out. I think we need to learn lessons uh, from any, uh, as with any pilot, as to um, what the best um, uh, deployment of that is and, and what potential steps can be taken forward. But of course it is, uh, you know, it is right to say it's, it's a truism that we would need funding, uh, significant funding to be uh, put in place um, uh, for us to, to be able to roll that out on, on a, a, a kind of comprehensive scale. Um, but it's, a, it's an agenda that we're, we're keen, to, to, keen to explore. Um, I, more generally, I think we need to be uh, striving for more affordable transport um, and uh, things like integrated ticketing, for example, across uh, different modes of transport is absolutely something that needs to be pursued as a priority. Um, it's been difficult to get the, um, the different providers together to agree um, to, uh, to, 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 to the sharing of systems, et cetera, that would be required for that. But I understand we now have a commitment from them for that to happen by 2024. So we need to hold them to that while also working uh, in the medium time. term on uh, new solutions like, uh, for example, franchising and public ownership of buses. Thanks very much. Okay, thank you very much, everybody, for answering that question. Um, we've had some really good questions so far, and we've still got a lot of good questions to come as well. Um, we're going to take just a very short break. Um, so uh, can we be back in two minutes, please? My clock says uh, four minutes past eight, so we'll be back at six minutes past eight. Thanks very much, everyone. Uh, so that's the recording back on. We've got all our candidates back. So I will carry on with our next question. So this question is from uh, Pedro and um, it's about just transition. So in terms of just transition, how can we ensure that renewable energy does not continue in the hands of monopolies and big corporations? That question goes first to Hugh Waterfield, please. Yes, that's definitely um, a difficulty. Almost every single good idea, the World Wide Web, for example, which was given to us free, has been subverted by people who are too smart. You could cut yourself on the words that they say. A just transition, well, there has to be, I suppose, unless we ban capitalism altogether, some element of profit, but there's no reason, I think, why society should not say X amount percent is permitted. Anything above that is a criminal act and we will prosecute you. I think we've got to be much more blunt in advance. And I think the question merits serious attention because for once, is not saying what should we have done five years ago or 25 years ago, but what should we do now or over the next five years? That makes a refreshing change. I think all elected councillors should put their mind onto this particular problem. How do we get a just share of social benefit right across the whole of society? because actually we need everybody, not just some. Thank you. Thanks very much. Let's go to Richard Johnson next on that question, please. Sure, thank you. Um, now, the way that you kind of ensure that there's a great spread of, um, I guess you could say ownership, if you want to put it that way, um, so that it's not monopoly, is essentially to have kind of energy security through a very varied range of energy sources. So you should have basically, you know, your renewables, wind, solar, uh, you know, looking look into things like tidal, et cetera. You should have 
nuclear, you should have domestic oil and gas production. And if you have a very wide spread of energy sources, then they can't all be owned and run and operated by the same people. It's not possible. Now, just to pick up on something about the um, making profit illegal, essentially, that would be such a terrible idea because all you would do if you capped profits and said, oh, well, that's illegal, then you disincentivize investment. The way you incentivize investment is by making it clear to people with the big money who are going to bring in huge investments, huge capital, is that there is a profit that can be made. And, and if you cap profits, it's like capping prices, all of a sudden you get a shortage. And so you'll have a shortage of investment. Um, so yeah, go for the widest possible range of energy sources and go all out on, on all of them, basically. And you won't have monopoly capitalism because there's no, there's no way that one organization can own everything. Thank you. Thanks very much, Richard. We'll go to Angus Miller next, please. Thanks, Kimberly. Um, and I think I, I touched on this uh, briefly earlier on, but um, one of the things that we wanted to do and that we've committed to in our manifesto is, is to have a community energy strategy. Um, so I, I think it's it's really important that we, we find ways to empower uh, local community organisations, for example, to, to, to have community energy generation um, and that, that's actually owned in the hands uh, of communities. Um, you know, there, there are some examples of where that's that's worked well um, in the in the city and the city region so far, but we need to find ways to, to kind of do more of that. And that could be even, on, you know, on a kind of individual um, building uh, basis, uh, you know, with uh, with uh, solar panels, etc., um, or something on a greater scale. Um, but we need to make sure that we've got both policies in place and uh, the resources ultimately um, to be able to, to empower and facilitate that kind of work to happen. Um, and uh, one of the things that, as I say, we'll do is we'll, we'll develop that strategy and that will uh, that, that will put in place um, uh, the responses that we need, um, uh, you know, kind of, uh, and, and, and ultimately we need to speak to the sector, speak to communities and understand what it is that they are looking for uh, from us. Um, another thing I would just uh, kind of see on that as well is, um, um, I think it's really important that we that we work on a lot of this at a kind of city region or even a, a kind of national level. Um, obviously, as a as a city, you know we have quite tightly defined boundaries. Um, and while there are uh, smaller scale opportunities within the city, within kind of densely populated urban areas, uh, obviously we've you know there, there are potentially going to be greater opportunities for um, some <laughs> modes of community uh, energy generation um, outside of the city. Um, so working at a city region level with uh, the kind of neighbouring authorities, which have more rural areas, is also going to be really important. Um, and, and of course, advocating for um, for the kind of investment and and policy uh, kind of responses that we need from national government as well to, to make it all happen. Great, thank you very much. Um, Martha Wardrop, please. Yeah, it's thanks very much. It's um, linked to the economic strategy of the city. I, I think there has to be a change in emphasis, looking at focus on people, not profit, and yeah. the well, health and well-being of people uh, is crucial, especially when we've got a cost of living crisis and energy issues affecting everyone more and more. The investment has to go into publicly owned and community owned renewable projects. Uh, we are going to be developing 20 minute neighbourhoods and there's more focus on local, you know, local neighbourhood planning. So I think as part of that, we, you know, we're advocating support for community groups and community organisations to get involved, in looking at energy supply within local neighbourhoods, joined up with district heating networks. There are obviously existing schemes there, there are, there's been a, some community energy projects up and running already. So there are it's drawing on the expertise that we already have um, and supporting people who have been active in supporting uh, community renewables. We, we can do a lot more, but we'll need supported within local neighborhoods, working with um, factors and landlords as well, 
we know there's not a private sector housing that could benefit from renewables like solar panels, heat pumps, you know, new technology to make them better and more effective in managing energy costs. So um, we are promoting a just transition board to be developed. So I'd hope that we can get everyone around the table working together through this new board being set up. Great, um, thanks very much, Martha. Uh, we'll move on to our next question, which is on hydrogen. How do the candidates feel about the use of hydrogen to tackle climate change? Does your party policy distinguish between green hydrogen and harmful blue hydrogen? We'll go first to Richard Johnson from the Scottish Conservatives, please. Sure, thank you. So my understanding of the Scottish Conservative policy is that we are very interested in basically hydrogen development. Obviously, it's kind of a an emerging technology. And yes, they do make a distinction between blue and green, green hydrogen. And I think, as I said, my understanding is essentially that we are exploring every possible kind of energy production strategy R and D, everything, particularly in the wake of you know Russia, Ukraine, this kind of thing. Essentially, if we are dependent on other foreign powers, particularly hostile powers for our energy, then that exposes us more and more to price shocks or to hostile action. So for me, it's about energy security, and green energy can absolutely play a role. I don't yet know if if hydrogen can play a role. As I said, because it's it's in kind of development. If you see what I'm saying, it's it's not as far advanced as other types of technologies yet. Um, you know, my understanding in terms of green energy is that it, 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 increasing green energy capacity is the fastest way for us to incre increase our energy production capacity. Um, but obviously, the problem with with it brings its own problems, which is to do with intermittency. And then we need to look at better battery technology, which is not yet here, but obviously there's a lot of R&D going into that as well. May well be with us in the not too distant future. Um, okay. The other thing is obviously with, with batteries, we have to talk about lithium, which like oil and gas in a, in a lot of cases comes from very authoritarian, corrupt countries and sources. And so there's kind of a problem there as well about how we negotiate that and try to negotiate that in terms of where we're purchasing it because we don't want to support these kind of authoritarian regimes. So I think there's a lot in in that question and, and a lot in about okay. renewables. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. And we'll go next to Angus Miller from SNP, please. Thanks, Kimberly. Uh, yes, um, I think. You know, we, we, we do see hydrogen as being um, part of the, the mix in terms of the, you know, the potential solutions uh, for renewable energy. I think it's an important distinction to make between blue and green um, hydrogen, and it's one that I think you know, uh, policymakers are, are increasingly aware of. Um, obviously, we've got um, at uh, Whiteley's um, the new um, uh, kind of green hydrogen uh, generation project uh, just outside of Glasgow, and, and that's we want to see more uh, like that. Um, but uh, ultimately, we, we need to, um, if we are to ramp up hydrogen um, uh, as, a, as a source within uh, the country, I think we need to make sure that we're not just making the mistake of um, just uh, actually having fossil fuels at a different stage of the generation process. Um, and, uh, you, you know, it, it, needs to, it needs to be entirely um, renewable. Um, uh, and, and that's certainly where we want to end up. So um, I don't think it's something that we have particularly advanced uh, plans uh, in Glasgow on at the moment, because it's obviously still a fairly emerging technology. But I think it's one that we are aware of, and it's something we have discussed uh, within the Council, um, the importance of, of being cognizant of that distinction. Um, and certainly as our uh, kind of climate action plans uh, progress and, and the kind of development of various strategies, um, it will be something that will be closely considered. Um, but in, in terms of the principle, yes, I absolutely agree that um, green hydrogen is um, uh, it's important to make that distinction. It's important to prioritise the, the, the use of green hydrogen over blue hydrogen. Great. Thank you very much. Um, next is Martha Wardrop, please. 
Yeah, I think this is a really important question. And it's something that all councillors need to be aware of, the, the risks around hydrogen. Um, so I think we've been we support green hydrogen where it can have, uh, where it's needed, but it has a limited role. We need to focus on other forms of renewable energy as that's more effective way forward. We have been talking about it already within the council. I've, wherever I see the word hydrogen, I always make sure green's put in front of it <laughs> and try and minimise the impact uh, of the, there are people pushing uh, hydrogen as a way to sustain the fossil fuel industry. And I'm concerned about um, unproven technologies such as carbon capture and storage. So Greens are very much concerned about making sure that we reject any unsustainable technologies and any planning going forward. Um, and green hydrogen has a role, but in a, a limited way. It's been talked about for bin lorries at the moment, and it's connected to Whiteley battery storage. That's, but I know that there's planning applications for development of hydrogen at various stages across the country, and it's something that we do have to keep a watchful eye on. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. Um, let's move on to Hugh Waterfield, please. Yes, I'm sorry, I've lost the um, picture at the moment. I've done something daft. Um, on hydrogen power, first of all, we have an endless fuel stock via hydrolysis. It does require some power input, but it can be stored and it can be transported and it would replace LPG and similar power sources. Is there any risk? Well, I would suggest no more than from oil or gas pipelines or indeed of, electric, of um, the, the chance of electrocution from high power lines. Tidal power and wave power, which are obviously in the potential future mix. Tidal power is available 24 seven, wave power both at night and day regardless. And lagoons as a, a means of trapping the potential power uh, is being investigated once again, I hope down in the Severn estuary. But we have quite a good re, uh, rise and fall of tides here. Anyway, I would certainly encourage people to consider hydrogen power for the future. Great, thank you very much, Hugh. Okay, we will move on to our next question, which comes from Liz Leonard, um, in, and it is on spending on public parks and play areas for children. So um, before last year's election, the First Minister promised a £60 million fund to revamp every children's play park across Scotland if the SNP were re-elected. In the Southside constituency, the play parks in Maxwell Park, Pollock Park and Queen's Park are in a terrible state of repair, with many pieces of equipment fenced off and unusable. During this pandemic, play parks provided a vital exercise and fresh air to all families with children, regardless of income level. Why has this money not been deployed in Glasgow and how do the candidates respond? Right, we'll go first to Hugh Waterfield, please. I'm sorry, um, could I pass on this one because I'm still struggling with um, whatever I've done wrong. Um, okay, we'll come back, come back to, to me later. Yeah, we'll yeah, do. Let's go to Richard Thank Johnson you. then, please. Yeah, sorry. Sure. Um, so one of our commitments is to basically have a dedicated local park fund. Um, this will be available for the for kind of small local parks, play parks, that kind of thing, um, but also, you know, for bigger parks. And essentially, we will be looking to kind of gather a whole range of kind of evidence on on the kind of parks that are kind of most most in need in this kind of thing. And we'll be investing in those areas. In terms of the SMP, I'm not sure you can trust 
an SNP administration of Glasgow to try and hold the national SNP to account, if you see what I'm saying. So funding promises can don't necessarily make sense if essentially we're getting massive cuts from central SNP. As I said, this year it's 19.7 million pounds was the funding shortfall from the SNP Green government in Holyrood. That's been passed down to Glasgow City Council. And then that instantly makes all of the various funding commitments a great problem. Obviously, so much in a council comes down to funding. Um, but you know, the SNP locally are not going to resist funding cuts from SNP Central. Um, to do that, you need a party that's going to fight for a fair funding deal for Glasgow. Scottish Conservatives will. One of the things that we want to support very much is um, a bill that the Scottish Conservatives, thank you, are introducing that will essentially um, require a certain percentage of the Barnett formula and Barnett formula increases in the future to automatically go to local councils. So it will no longer be dependent on the whims of the SNP government in Holyrood. That funding will be an automatic increase. So you can think of it as a Barnett formula for local councils. And then that can go on play parts and, and this kind of thing. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Richard. Let's go to Angus Miller next, please. Thanks, Kimberly. I mean, firstly, on that, that latter point, I think in the course of the various answers to the questions that I've given over the, the, the last uh, hour and, and a bit, um, I think I've said that we'd be advocating for investment from national uh, Scottish government um, on several different issues. And indeed, uh, the SNP in Glasgow will, will always uh, work constructively, yes, with the Scottish government, uh, but we will always be making the case for investment in Glasgow and, and in Glasgow services. And, and we've done so um, on any number of, of issues uh, over the last five years uh, and will continue to do so. Um, on the on the question itself, um, yes, the, the, there's commitment there for um, investment in play parks from, from national government. Uh, we have seen, um, I believe, the first uh, uh, tranche uh, of that funding come to Glasgow, and that's kind of been worked through in terms of how that will go to support um, capital investment this year. Um, I, I would say it, that the commitment that was given, you know, was, was given for a five-year parliamentary term, uh, and we are less than one year into that term. Um, so I would expect that that resource to be delivered over the over the uh, the course um, of the parliamentary term. And um, obviously, we want to see that come to, to Glasgow uh, as quickly as possible, and we will be engaging with the Scottish government uh, on that. Um, we have a commitment uh, in our manifesto to to undertake a program of investment in uh, uh, play areas uh, within the city. We've already uh, a kind of key focus of our first term uh, has been in investing in multi-use game areas uh, within the city, kind of uh, uh, kind of games courts. Um, we we want to similarly invest uh, in, up, in upgrading and maintaining uh, play parks uh, and play areas within the city, and indeed we'll match that Scottish government investment as it comes in to, to local resource where that's appropriate. Um, and another thing that we've done is um, we've uh, introduced uh, over the last couple of years. Um, a Parks and Open Spaces Fund within the Council uh, worth £3 million across the city, uh, which has been spent locally by area partnerships, which is kind of community planning structures locally that uh, involve community councils uh, and uh, other community organisations to direct that funding in local wards towards parks projects, initiatives, um, and a number of areas that has um, gone uh, towards and been allocated towards uh, the refurbishment of play parks uh, and others that's gone to kind of green space and biodiversity improvements. So that kind of approach of, of investment and, and of delivering investment for community to spend locally is absolutely something that we want to, to do more of as well. Um, but in terms of the Scottish Government investment, uh, I understand that that will come over the period uh, of the parliamentary term. As I say, we have the, the initial tranche of that um, and we'll be working to deliver that as soon as possible. Okay, thank you very much. Um, right, okay, let's go on to Martha Wardrop, please. Yeah, recognise the, the, the need for upgrades of play areas, and that's been prioritised in the budget that was passed at the Council. Um, it's been discussed by, by Greens, and we've pushed for investment, uh, making sure that um, all play parks get upgraded in the next five years. I think there's obviously, if there's health and safety concerns, they can should be addressed urgently. If you know of play parks that need urgent attention, that's something you need to flag up to, to councillors to get attention at local ward level. We have got, uh, say, ward funds coming forward. 
to support parks and open spaces. So if there's a particular areas that people want attended to, I think they should be asking local councillors for support. We have to obviously support um, forest schools, outdoor nurseries and wider outdoor education involving uh, nature reserves and you know, there, there are a, a range of places that uh, we can support through um, supporting biodiversity improvements, working with conservation volunteers, working with families, um, supporting woodland areas as well, and, and supporting wider understanding about uh, ecological emergency and the need to support nature in, as part of learning. So we are, we've got to outline clearly in our manifesto our commitment to play areas and we will prioritise it as part of capital investments. 30 seconds left if you want to say anything else, Martha. It's just work with children and young people is obviously crucial as well. And there's the Glasgow Youth Forum and there's uh, obviously working with schools and looking at play areas within schools is another area of concern. I know that a lot of schools would like to see improvements uh, in play facilities. So we will work with parent councils and if, you, if people have got concerns to come to their councillors and ask for support with any investments that's needed. Thank you very much, that's time. Um, let's go to Hugh Waterfield, please. I don't know um, as much as I should about investment, but I think if we could bring some pressure to bear in the political system to enhance the esteem of local government. While the roof of a building is important, if the foundations are rotten, you're in real trouble. Now, let me give you an example. The Glasgow Airport Rail Link. That somehow got forgotten because it wasn't in Edinburgh, as the name would suggest. Plenty of money was apparently available for the excellent electrically operated trams that are now one of the features of our capital city. But if we could get people onto electric trains going rapidly to Glasgow Airport, might we not also reduce our dependence upon the internal combustion engine? It's a point worth considering, isn't it? And that is the sort of wide ranging thinking that all of us here this evening need to take on board. Thank you. Thanks very much, Hugh. Okay, so um, thank you for that question. We have time for at least one more question. We'll go to uh, one from Isla Scott, which is about allotments and food growing. Um, so the question is, there are, is a long waiting list for allotments citywide. What would candidates do to address that? this? Um, and we will go first to Angus Miller from SNP, please. Thanks very much. Um, yes, I, I think we, we need to continue to, to invest in creating new allotment space and food growing space, um, uh, both in terms of uh, kind of traditional allotments, but but also food growing um, in in new contexts and locations. We we have continued to invest uh, every uh, single year over the last couple of years. Indeed, I think we had a, um, a report to committee um, earlier this year, which kind of set out the new. Um, areas within the city that um, uh, will be receiving additional food growing spaces uh, and I believe there's, a, there's um, at least uh, some uh, within every single ward in the city um, but absolutely we need to we need to go further and we need to we need to secure the investment that's needed to to do that um, one of the the, the, the ways that we've been able to, to support investment in food growing is for example through the parks and open space fund that I've, that I've mentioned there um, uh, with with kind of local communities directing uh, resources towards um, food growing initiatives within within their areas, and that would be really exciting to see that kind of move forward. Um, I think we also need to um, have stronger planning policies within um, our planning uh, documentation to um, promote 
um, the uh, inclusion of food growing spaces within new developments, um, and also kind of review what the financial levers we are, uh, sorry, we have uh, are in order to support food growing. So, for example, a lot of the food growing um, investment that that happens in the city just now comes from developers' contributions, uh, where uh, developers. Uh, don't um, have uh, don't meet a, a kind of certain quota within a development of green or amenity space, um, and that's then diverted into um, in, into food growing um, uh, provision elsewhere. And, and while that's uh, you know a good uh, kind of use of, of of that particular money, um, clearly we need to have um, additional investment as well. So uh, reviewing kind of what the funding streams are that are available, um, continuing to support the delivery of new food growing spaces. Um, and both uh, on a kind of uh, a large kind of scale and also kind of local community um, food growing spaces, uh, I think is, is really important and uh, we've got a range of ways that we can take that forward. Thanks very much. Martha Wardrop. I think there's an opportunity to do a lot more in the next uh, five years to meet the needs of people who want allotments. Obviously, part of it is supporting allotment, existing allotment committees and developing capacity to run an allotment. It does create a lot of hard work um, organising and running an allotment site. Um, so there's there are forums where people can work together and receive support and advice to be able to set up an allotment. And I would encourage you to, to reach out and, and spend, meet up with other or visit allotment sites. Um, we've got Greens have pushed for additional money to be spent in the last few years on new allotment sites, but we're, we're focused on looking at vacant and derelict land sites, brownfield sites, which could be brought back into use. Um, so I think we can transform this, creating much more uh, useful uh, land uh, and clear up sites which maybe are impacted by fly tipping at the moment. Or contamination, we can get them cleaned up and transformed into food growing areas. So there's, there's a lot of benefits from allotments. Obviously, with the food um, issues that people are facing at the moment, uh, getting people active outdoors, uh, meeting up and socialising to grow food is obviously really beneficial for everyone's health. So we've we need to bring in more uh, partnership working with the health service. Um, we've seen a lot more interest. Um, from them as well there's and obviously working across the public sector to look at all sites that potentially could be transformed not just council sites so we, we hope through the city plan uh, and obviously working with allotments groups we can push for more sites to be allocated in the next five years to meet the demand thanks for the question thanks very much martha we'll go to key waterfield next please I remember very well about 15 years ago asking what the situation was for allotment uh, applicants uh, in Jordan Hill and I was told five years minimum you would have to wait and the situation has become worse. Spaces actually exist. Unfortunately, because of rather lopsided funding, Glasgow City Council or certainly the Treasurer's Department has favoured building on spare bits of land rather than having them available for people to tackle well. Healthy diet, exercise, social gathering, not to mention the possibility of lower carbon miles, for produce, there must, I'm sure, be brownfield sites are plenty across the city. And we don't want very large, at least I don't think we should encourage very large allotments. They should be well distributed so that people have one within walking distance of where they stay. I've discovered one by chance very recently down at the bottom of Sandy Road, if you know it, south of Dumbarton Road. Um, it was a bit of an eye-opener. Such a good idea, sensitively handled. I know there has to be security for, to prevent some people from either vandalizing the place or stealing the produce, which would be very off-putting for those who put a lot of hard work in. But 
I really do think that the allotment movement needs all the help it can get. And I would encourage anybody elected on the 5th of May to seriously consider how they may push that ahead. Thank you. Thanks very much. And then Richard Johnson, please. Sure, thank you. Um, so I kind of got a two part answer to this one as well. Um, firstly, I know that the Scottish Conservatives are wanting to kind of um, push ahead with what they're calling local food strategies. Um, now, it's kind of partly to do with allotments and it's partly to do with Scottish farmers and kind of local produce. And again, it, it is partly to do with kind of low, getting lower carbon miles on your food and this kind of thing and knowing where your food it has come from. And as part of that, um, we want to kind of increase P4 and P5 education on kind of the sources of food, where food is coming from. Obviously, our allotments are a really good way to actually show kind of children an example of, of where food comes from. So it is, it is something that we kind of very much support. Um, now, in terms of, of developing them, um, in general, on the whole, we're, we're supporting development kind of on brownfield sites. Now, it depends where, where suitable and that kind of thing. Um, about fly tipping, I mean, I don't know how much fly tipping and, and dumped waste affects the land. You see what I'm saying? In terms of a lot more growing, would, they, would that land need to be treated afterwards and all that kind of thing? So there might be questions there, I'm um, not sure. Um, but yeah, local food strategies, okay. uh, including both, um, did you say 30 seconds or did you say done? 30 seconds. 30 seconds yeah. local, local food strategies, you know, where is your food come from? Children's education includes allotments, includes Scottish farmers. Thank you. Thanks very much. Okay, uh, looking at time, um, I think I'm going to do one more question, um, but I'm going to um, shorten it and ask everybody to keep to one minute. We've had a lot of comments about green spaces on the last few questions. So I'm going to make the last question um, about biodiversity. So this was from Andrea on the topics of parks. Would councillors do anything to move park departments away from exotic plants and towards native species that encourage wildlife? and to increase wildlife areas such as no more mowing and weed killers etc. Um, can we go to Martha Wardrop first please and just one minute for this question. Yeah it's something I've been supporting and pushing for and there has been reductions in the use of um, any kind of pesticides but more work needs to be done there's still a large number of people in Glasgow who complain about weeds. And we need to educate the wider public about the benefits of weeds, like dandelions, for example, which was, there's currently a, quite a, a positive campaign about that on social media, which I think is helping. We need to have much wider public awareness about the benefits of weeds. 30 seconds. Support biodiversity and work with the Parks Department, Friends of Parks groups to, to raise awareness of the need to support biodiversity. Thank you. Thanks very much, Martha. Um, Hugh Waterfield. Yes, I entirely agree with Martha's points. We really must do better at educating people to understand that we are ourselves part of the biosphere. We have, um, I think, a, a very large number of uh, opportunities uh, fast disappearing. We all know, at least I hope we all know, about something called the Red List. A very great deal of entries appear on that. We that must, it. as fast as we can, bring people to understand that they have a chance to do something about it. We can't force them to do the right thing but we can encourage them and praise them when they do thanks thank you very much um richard johnson 
Thank you. Um, so about the non-native species part, uh, we I have had conversations about how the Scottish government, obviously they've planted a lot of trees, but a lot of these trees have been of faster growing, but non-native species. Um, so yes, we are, the Scottish Conservatives are kind of aware of, of using, I guess you could say native, native species and, and moving away from exotic plants. In terms of green spaces, it's a big commitment. Uh, for, for us as well. That's why we're kind of emphasizing development on brownfield sites, not on green spaces. Um, we also want thank to, thank you. Uh, we also want to um, basically make sure that, that Glasgow has, or is centered by a kind of large and beautiful green space, as we think that, that adds a lot of kind of, um, not just character, but it, it's, you know, about having a lovely place to, to visit and be, and as you said, biodiversity, those kinds of things. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Richard. Angus Muller. Thanks very much. Uh, absolutely. Um, I agree with the premise of the question. It's something that as a local councillor, I have uh, already been engaged in in my communities, trying to uh, get the Parks Department to, to shift the way that they operate. And indeed, um, that there has been some success locally and they, they kind of piloted within a number of parks within my ward a, a kind of a reduction in uh, herbicide treatment and uh, kind of moving to a different style of management that's more uh, parks management that's more in collaboration with local friends of uh, and green space groups um, and I think that's absolutely something that we want to roll out uh, more broadly. Within the SNP's manifesto, we commit to an updated herbicide policy. We want to reduce our, our reliance on chemical weed killers um, as part of our investment in neighbourhoods cleansing and deep clean services. We've got a new uh, neighbourhood enhancement team, which will shift the balance uh, towards more kind of uh, uh, kind of hand uh, weeding um, of, of, of the kind of less valuable, uh, you know, kind of weeds there um, to, to, to try and move away from herbicides. Um, and we uh, also have a commitment within our manifesto to supporting wilding um, and uh, kind of nature uh, restoration within our parks and open spaces. Okay. Thank you. Um, thanks everybody for answering that question. And um, that is all the time we have for questions tonight. I'd now like to ask each of the candidates to make a closing statement, please. So um, you each have two minutes and we will start with Hugh Waterfield, please. As I've already said, the climate tipping point could be as near to us as five years off. The impact will be on the poorest, on the Pacific Island states, on the youngest people, the sick and the elderly, any area of high ambient daytime temperature, desertification may increase and we can do something about mitigating that here in Glasgow. When I was very young, I could plead ignorance. I remember walking along a path in India, practically having to bat the butterflies out of the way. That will never happen again, thanks to new, the use of neonicotinoids. Post David Attenborough and Greta Thunberg, we can no longer say we didn't know what it was all about. Thanks. Thank you very much, Hugh. Uh, let's move on to Richard Johnson, please. Sure, thank you very much. So um, I guess from the conversation tonight, I, um, I just want to say that I kind of, uh, I admire anyone here yeah, standing for a lo local election. I think it's a big, um, it's a big task, and I can see that everyone, all the candidates here, I think, have their hearts in the right place. They're wanting to address issues. You know, we have our disagreements on various policies. We agree on some things, disagree on others, but I think the hearts are in the right place in general. Um, you know, the Scottish Conservatives. You know, on the fifth of May, the reason why we are standing is essentially we want to clean up Glasgow. We have our, our five point plan, which involves, you know, uh, restoring the, the fortnightly bin collection, removing the, the bulk of lift charge in its entirety, investing 10 million pounds in frontline cleansing services. Those are real practical things that will improve the lived environment of Glasgow 
as we're currently going through a, a cleansing crisis. Um, as I said um, previously, we also want to fight for a fair, fair funding deal for Glasgow. Um, as I said, there are cuts coming down from, from the central government. Um, it can only be resisted by a party that is willing to hold the SNP nationally to account. And that can't be the SNP locally because they're the same party. And it can't be Labour because Labour are in coalition with the SNP and six councils across Scotland. So the Scottish Conservatives are, are here to keep the, the focus on your local priorities. It's not about independence. It's not about various national issues that we have no control over. It's simply about those local priorities and many of the things we've spoken about today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Richard. Let's move on to Angus Miller, please. Thanks, uh, Kimberly, and thank you uh, to everybody for, for your time this evening and for, for having us along as candidates. It's, it's been an enjoyable experience. Um, I think, as I said at the beginning, tackling the, the climate emergency uh, needs to be a key priority over the, over the next uh, five-year term. Uh, we've set ambitious 2030 uh, net zero targets, and uh, we, we don't have an awful lot of time to meet them. So we need uh, urgent action, uh, and we need uh, everybody to, 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 to be working together across the city and moving um, in the same direction um, uh, for us to be able to achieve that. Um, as I've outlined tonight, the SNP is committed to, to working uh, to improve uh, public transport, to decarbonise public transport, connecting communities with uh, the Clyde Metro proposal, joining up and integrating public transport with tap and cap uh, ticketing, um, and uh, exploring, uh, uh, working towards, for example, uh, franchising and public ownership for buses. Uh, we are already working to reduce car usage um, within the city, um, and we are promoting active travel, and indeed we'll be accessing over the next five years um, record Scottish Government funding and active travel that's, that's been made available uh, and securing that um, for investment and infrastructure here in Glasgow. Um, we talked about the need to tackle uh, energy efficiency and home energy retrofit, as well as opportunities like district heating, and these need to be key priorities. And, and all of us um, uh, parties are, are going to need to work together. Um, no one party has a, a monopoly um, on ideas, um, and I would expect that all parties uh, would be collaborating. Um, but that said, um, compared to, to Labour and the Tories, at least it's clear that the SNP um, is the one with the, the ambitious plans um, for uh, taking the city forward in a way that tackles um, the climate emergency. Um, and it's uh, absolutely crucial that we take communities with us um, as we um, embark on that particular journey. Um, and finally, we've talked a lot about investment tonight. We estimate that it will be uh, around £30 billion pounds cost to decarbonise Glasgow. That's obviously not something that we, as a local authority alone, can meet. So we need to be bold in making the case for investment in Glasgow uh, from all spheres of government to pull together. Um, and that's absolutely something that, that we will be taking forward. Thank you very much. And can we move on to Martha Wardrop, please? Thanks, Kimberly, for your chairing this evening. Really appreciate it. Thanks for all the questions. Um, so uh, we know that tackling the climate emergency needs real leadership, ambition, and action at the local level. This will require integrating climate adaptation and mitigation into all aspects of our life, not as an afterthought. Being councillors will ensure that Glasgow delivers on the ambitious emissions reduction targets that we have set. And crucially, the action is taken in a way that considers the needs of everyone. Since 2017, Scottish Green councillors have spearheaded the council's response to the climate and nature emergencies and secured Glasgow's 2030 net zero carbon target. And we created a climate emergency fund to invest in renewable energy, green transport and restoring nature. We brought the landmark decision to stop investing in the council's pension fund and fossil fuels. And we developed Glasgow's plastic reduction plan and we invested in re recycling for flats and tenements. So in the next five years, we'll continue to lead uh, Glasgow's action to, to uh, support people in a, what will be uh, likely to be uh, severer uh, weather events and we will we'll have to reach out and work across communities in the city. Our green councillors will be crucial in leading efforts to invest in the city, to meet our, all our ambition and create the employment opportunities uh, and the support services that people really need. 
to address the climate and ecological emergency. Climate change is unfair and we will all need to support each other and work together to tackle uh, the needs of the most vulnerable uh, and also keep, keep climate justice at the heart of all that we do. So please vote for urgent action to build a greener and fairer Glasgow. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martha. And um, thank you very much to all of our candidates tonight. Um, that is the end of things this evening. Um, you can find out more information on these issues through our local election manifesto, which is available at foe.scot. And you can also sign up to become a member of Friends of the Earth Scotland via our website as well. Um, thank you very much, everybody, for attending tonight and for all your questions. And thank you once again to our candidates. Okay, good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys.